Our first speaker this afternoon is Jim McElwain, who's going to be telling us about the dynamics of granular flows. Great, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've changed my uh, talk a little bit after some discussions this morning, so I was told that I should put as many equations in as possible, and you didn't want any pictures or movies, so my original background was as a mathematician, so I'm very happy to go along with that for you. So what is granular matter? So this is a little bit different from um, what a lot of you do, but of course you see in the environment all the time that there are grains everywhere. So, um, how do I get the pointers to work? The middle one, okay. Right, so this is, a, this is not a natural, uh, this is not a natural uh, granular flow, but this is a ping pong ball avalanche in Japan. 650,000 ping pong balls designed to test the interaction of grains with a fluid. The next picture over, we see what happens to a building if it gets hit by an avalanche. So an avalanche is of course a granular flow, it's grains of snow. And it may behave like a dry granular flow, so just dry grains. But the big ones, the powder snow avalanches, it's a two-phase mixture. Now, many um, industrial materials go through a granular processing stage, about 40% by value, apparently. So there's a huge amount of money. What you can see here is a storage silo that's collapsed. Now, these things have been built. There are millions of them all over the world. You'd think that the engineers would know how to build them. But actually, it's a continuous problem because the underlying equations that really describe accurately the stress distribution in the granular material and how it flows are not known. So there's huge problems scaling these things. So people build these large silos or mixing drums, and then they don't operate, and they have to go and hit them with hammers or rebuild them. So I showed, you, uh, I showed you the powder snow avalanche at the bottom. And then there's a picture here of a concrete pylon, which is um, broken. And here, concrete is, of course, is a very um, poorly sorted mixture of grains all held together in a matrix. And every few weeks in the news somewhere around the world, some poorly built concrete building collapses. And often what the problem is, there's not enough cement, but it can also be due down due to the fact that the materials have segregated when you're mixing your concrete. If you have all small particles in one part of the structure and big particles somewhere else, then the thing is going to break. So what we want to do is try to develop continuum models which will describe these grain flows in nature and in the industrial setting. And the problem at the moment is, you know, for fluids, we have Navier-Stokes equations. Now, as we've heard today, you know, that's incredibly hard to solve directly in many sensible cases or the practical cases in the environment. So we have to do LES modeling or RANDs or things like that. But with granular flow, we don't know an equation of state and a constitutive relation that will have widespread applicability. There's a load of empirical models and theories which may be good or not so good in different situations, but it's not even clear when they're going to work. So one of the things to try to do is to directly simulate these systems, compare these simulations with experiments, and then try to figure out how we can develop continuum models and upscale these things to the situations that we're really interested in. Now, this is particularly important when we start looking on other planets. Now these are all pictures taken by the high-rise instrument on Mars. This is an amazing camera. It has a pixel size of about 70 centimeters. And um, the bottom left-hand picture, you can see some small powder snow avalanches on Mars, which are a mixture of calm dioxide snow <coughs> and um, dust. You can see some strange zigzag gullies, which have happened on a very shallow slope, probably too low for granular flow. But one of the things I'm going to talk about later is that some people have argued that friction is different on Mars because gravity is lower. And that's the type of, uh, that the paper that claimed that actually got a lot of uh, publicity and has had a lot of citations. And that's one of the problems is that until we really have a theory arguing about how these things should scale on other planets is a problematic and controversial um, question. <clears throat> Now, if you uh, 
probably not so much in Colorado, but certainly a lot in Arizona and Utah, you get washboard road, which you see at the top. So this is a small-scale granular instability. There's lots of other type of patterns you can get, whether it's the wind blowing sand around, making ripples and dunes, or rivers leaving all sorts of bed forms at the bottom. And again, by trying to combine a mixture of lab experiments and simulations and field observations, we're trying to make progress in these areas. Now, I'm not going to talk, I was originally going to um, go through the details of some of these simulation methods. So these next slides, I'm just going to talk about one or two of them and then skip through to some uh, more results. But what's nice about granular mechanics is we can do these direct simulations where we simulate every particle. And these were first done for granular systems in the late 70s, but really the techniques go much earlier to when people were doing molecular simulations of liquids. So people were trying to calculate heat transport and viscosity of liquids from first principles by simulating all the interactions. And granular materials are actually easier to simulate because they just have local interactions. So the bottom picture is a schematic of one particle crashing in to some others. So what is the basic of this um, simulation technique? You detect when the particles interact with each other. So when they're very close, then you make some sort of force law in between them which will push them apart and deal with the contact. And you can put in friction and cohesion. And it's very easy to make complicated force laws. But most of the time, the simulation results only depend very weakly on actually how you do this. And then you just integrate the differential equation of motion for each particle. Then you calculate and store the interesting data. Now what's nice about this is that the system is order n. So if you've got n particles, that's how it scales. So if you have twice as many particles, it only takes you half as much time. So that's the basics. If anyone's interested in more of the details, how you do the contact detection, what are the type of force laws, all of this type of thing, what are the appropriate time integration methods, I'd be very happy to go through this. Now, this was the paper I was alluding to earlier where people were saying, well, you know, maybe friction is different on Mars. Though anyone with a physics background would object to this on dimensional, dimensional grounds. But anyway, these people wanted to try this out. So they got this plane, and they had all these, rota they had all these drums, which you see in the bottom left here. And the idea is that they're going to rotate them and they're going to measure the angle of the surface and say this is the friction. And if you rotate at a particular a slow enough speed, you get solid body rotation and then intermittent avalanches. So the idea was they'd measure these. So they put these up in the plane and lo and behold, the mean angles were lower when the plane was on one of these low G things. Now the problem is they can only maintain the low gravity for about 30 seconds, so they would have poor statistics, the gravity varies, there's a lot of vibrations, and we were really um, unconvinced that this actually made any physical, physical sense, so we decided to, to look at this. So let me show, uh, right, where is the mouse gone? I need to click on one of these things and I can't, um, sorry. Okay, so this is the um, avalanching state. If you have a drum that you rotate it very slowly. Now when you're doing these uh, simulations, your time step has to be a small fraction of the collision time between grains. Grains collide very quickly. This is a very slow process. So this is why I've used, partly why I've used so many uh, CPU hours, and I'm very uh, pleased to have had, been able to get all of these. That takes a lot of time. Now if you go a little bit faster, you have a steady flow. And here, this is pretty much a constant angle. So this is a fairly constant dynamic friction angle that you can see in this state. Again, this is an experiment, obviously. Now when you start getting, okay, when you start going faster, other types of things can happen. Before, in this steady case, there's a local balance of driving force and friction. Here, there's inertia taking place in the flowing layer, so you get a curved effect. And if you go faster, it um, starts cascading and looking a bit like a, a waterfall. So let's go back to... 
full screen. Um, and now we have the cursor. So the question is, can we get these with um, simulations? So believe it or not, this simulation is actually actually moving. But when you have this is a simulation with perfectly round particles, it turns out, and there's no nat there's no vibrations, of course, in the simulation. So this is what's really nice. You can eliminate all these extra effects. Even in any experiment, there's always some vibration. You have end walls. This is a periodic simulation. You have to go incredibly slowly to really get these. It's actually playing, isn't it? Yeah. You have to go, so you can see a, small, a, f a few small rearrangements. You have to go incredibly slowly to get this avalanching state. It's really, really sensitive. So there you see one, one happening, and it will stop, and then it's going to stay for a long time. But actually, at first, when we started doing these simulations, we were a bit concerned because we just couldn't find this avalanching state because we had to go so slow. Now, you can also do these simulations with angular particles, or you can glue the spheres together to make much more effectively rough shapes, and then this happens much easier. But we were quite relieved when eventually we did manage to get, so we can get the steady state again. <clears throat> and this is sort of this S-shaped state where inertia starts becoming important. And if we go really fast, we get a cascading state where they're just about um, to start centrifuging around the edge. You can also look at what happens when we start making the thing really long. So, of course, one of the things you might want to know about is what happens with the effects of the end walls. So what this is telling you about is the lateral transmission of stresses in the system. So again, but what you see here with this slow rotation rate is that these actual avalanching behaviors are correlated over quite a long width. So if a small amount of the material starts moving at some spot, it starts in moving at another spot. So there's long range order going on. And physicists would expect this because effectively we're looking at a sort of a phase transition. It's somewhere between the, the flowing state and the steady state. And what the correlation is between this motion tells us a lot about what the underlying um, physics is of these flows. <clears throat> so the basic idea with these things is there's a few non-dimensional groups about the radius of the drum divided by the particle size, so how big the drum is in terms of particles, both diameter and length. And then the only way that gravity enters in is just through the rotation rate. So the idea is if you change the rotation rate, it's the same as changing gravity. And of course, if you do simulations, you can, you're going to non-dimensionalize them mostly, so you're going to set gravity or something to one anyway. So you really, there's no way that gravity can actually affect the results if all you have is a frictional law. If you put in cohesion and other forces like this, then you expect a difference. But what we wanted to do is reproduce or try to explain the results from this um, low G experiment. So this is just a trace of what one of our experiments looks like. And in fact, it could just as well be a simulation or as an experiment. So what you're seeing in the top is the trace of the surface angle. So it's moving up and then it's dropping down. And these triangles, we identify the maximum and minimum. And then we draw these histograms. And what you'll see is there's a huge variation in these. So to actually get any kind of reasonable values, even for an experiment, we have to run it for hours and hours and not 30 seconds. And then we get a distribution of starting and stopping angles. So what we can see is there's no well-defined dynamic friction angle and static friction angle, but there's a whole range of these. Now, why is this particular transition so interesting? Well, this is because the, this is the natural state for most granular material. If you have a desert sand dune, the material is deposited till it gets onto this critical state. A bit more sand and it might fall down. If it's much flatter, it will just build up. So the middle frame, the, these are, um, let's just talk about this one in the middle left. These are histograms of the starting and stopping angles for the avalanche. So, so the red ones, do the red ones correspond to the lower triangle, to the red triangle? Uh, that's unfortunate, the colors are that way around. They're, they're swapped. Sorry about that. Well spotted. You're definitely awake in the front row. There's, I won't go over the details of what these other things are for now. But there's, absolute, there's another um, complication. So if you looked at this, so these are 
all the different experiments we did, so we vary the food number, so this is the ratio effectively of the centripetal acceleration to gravity, and we look at these, the mean of these distributions. Now you might think, oh, we must have varied something else here, these are different sized particles or something, but in fact these are the same particles just over running the experiment for a couple of weeks. So what of course happens with natural part with particles, which doesn't happen with the simulation, is the surface wears, you get dust. So actually it's very difficult even to do these experiments repeatedly because the materials are continually degrading and changing. So this is a, a typical problem with granular material that you have to work very hard to get reproducible results. Your state preparation can be very important and the particles degrade and change over time. <clears throat> Anyway, we did eventually manage to get some um, repeatable results, and we could show the same effects as they got from the, their zero-g flights, but we just can explain this as a change in the uh, food number and the effects of vibration. And now we've, each one of these data points here, this is several months of computer simulation time where we varied the food number, the radius of the drum, and the diameter of the drum, and Q here is the, is the, surface, the mean surface slope angle, and we've got a little theory here which will collapse all of these surface angles onto this bottom one. And the one on the right, this is for a different type of particle which is a rough particle, so we've glued them together to make them rough. And again we get the same type of result. So we've now got a model that can describe this behaviour in the, in the drum. Now you might say this drum, this is very far from a geophysical situation. Well, We've also been um, doing the experiments with sand and things like that. But what's nice about this experiment is we now think we have a protocol where you can go and get any material from the field, you can put it in your drum, and the computer will just run the experiment for a few weeks, and you will probe how the material wears, and what its behavior is in the continuous flowing regime, the transitioning. So it's a very effective way of measuring nearly everything that you might want to know about a natural granular material. And we can look at, these are the, the pictures of where the transition happens. So this d skew is a measure of a skewness in the velocity distribution. So we get a very nice typical kind of bifurcation here. And the difference between uh, the left and the right is the effect of the sidewalls, which is quite uh, profound in this case. And that's because it affects the correlations. Now something else that's very important, and of course all natural materials pretty well, they're a mixture of different sizes. And you know, there's the Brazil nut effect, if you like muesli for breakfast, the big things end up on the top. And the question is, you know, what effect does this have on the flow dynamics? And the first thing, if you want to know that, you also want to know is how quickly will materials segregate? Now this is a very um, simple experiment with a single intruder, and you see it rising up to the top. And this is extremely generic behavior that happens all the time. This shows you a before and after shot, big particles at the bottom, moving to big particles on the top. Again, this is something you can do in a drum experiment. This drum here has got two different sizes of particles. And in this case, it's doing a slightly different type of intermittent behavior where you've got a hydraulic shock jumping up. But as the stuff flows down, it segregates up to the top, and that's why it leads to this beautiful pattern. In a minute, the drum's about to speed up, and then you're going to get a continuous flow. And it's going to start looking a little bit different. It's still segregating, but now it no longer has this, well, hopefully soon. It will still be segregating, but it will no longer have this discrete um, structure. Here we go. So we're getting this, the central core is basically not moving, and all the small particles are ending up around the edge. Now, you can do these type of experiments, but it's very difficult to take good observations. If you're looking through the edge, what you see is dominated by the end walls. People are trying, and we've tried to do experiments in MRI things. You can also use radioactive particles, x-rays. It's extremely difficult to get good data. Whereas with a simulation, we can chuck the particles in with whatever size we want. We can have end walls or periodic, and we can measure the position of every particle and really try to develop theories about how these things are moving in time. So the first thing perhaps is that we've done is just you know, look at these things a lot, look at what's going on, and then try to see, this is 
the result of one simulation, big going to big particles going to the top again, and try to develop intuition and then um, some theoretical postulates to make a proper theory. So there's a little bit of math here. Sigma ij is the stress. Now, if you've got two different sorts of particles, there's a stress tensor corresponding to particle 1 and particle 1, and a stress tensor corresponding to particle 2 and particle 2, but there's also a stress tensor in between the two. And it turns out that if you hypothesize that these stress components, there's a kinetic bit, which is just like the temperature of the molecules, you might think, and then there's a contact type term, which is also quadratic, and the question is, is what are these coefficients, beta and gamma? So this was our hypothesis, and it's how the stress is divided up between the particles that determines what happens. And basically, segregation is caused because the big particles take more of the stress. They're in a pressure gradient because of gravity, so they push up to the top. So we had this ANSATS, and then we want to see, is it going to be true from um, the simulations where we can measure these stress components exactly? And if you uh, do a bit of math, you can get a Burgers equation, which you can solve. So we can predict what should happen in shear flows. So here, oh. how can I get it to uh, click on the? It's on some other mode. I wanted to be on a movie, but it's, um, oh, there we go, yeah, no, well, let's go try this one, it's not giving me the right type of pointer, oh, okay, I'm just, there you go. Just double right, okay, so this is, a, this is speeded up a lot, so this is a whole lot of particles all started off mixed. It's actually, it's doubly periodic, but it's shearing down the slope, and you can see all the big particles going up to the top. It turns out, you know, for dense, for a fairly deep flow like this, this is very time consuming. It actually takes quite a long time for the particles to move up. If you have a shallow flow, like you were seeing in those drum experiments, it happens much, much faster. So if you had a space-time plot where the color here represents um, all red is all big particles, all blue slash purple is all small particles, this is the height from the bed and this is time, it starts off mixed and then over time we, just, we get um, these two shocks moving in until they merge and we get all the small at the bottom and all the big at the top and this is a comparison with the theory. You can also try what's in here. It's, it, the solution has an expansion fan and two shocks. So here we've started off with the small particles on the on the um, on the top, and the big particles. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And now the particles are going to reverse. So you know you see this type of inverse grading in deposits all the time when you look at turbidity currents and all sorts of natural flows. So now, you know, we have this model and which we verified with these simulations, so we can say how long does it take for this type of segregation to occur. So if we have a field deposit that we can look at and understand, maybe we can say something about what happened with the flow. And some people in the past, for example, have argued that if there's only a small size difference, you get no segregation. Here we've got particles which are only 1% difference. You wouldn't notice this in experiment. The results here, they look the same, but we can see the dent differences in the profiles. And if we go up to particles which are 2.2, the big ones are 2.2 times the small ones, we see that we get a perfectly segregated layer at the top, but because there's still some diffusion going on, even the steady profile still has some of these big ones towards the bottom, but it's not symmetric. There are none of the small ones at the top. And again, we can predict that now with our, with our theory that we've developed. And there's, and there's a neat um, thing you can do with simulations, which you could never do with experiments, is you could try to get a steady segregating flux. So here, when the small particles get to the bottom, we take them out and we drop them back up at the top. And what that means is we, um, we have a steady state 
of, we have a steady state flux rather than the steady state being zero flux. And we get this um, prediction for the profile that has a maximum in the middle rather than having all the particles at the top or the bottom. And again, we have an analytic solution which agrees quite well. Now, I said that you know, the key thing is we're making this hypothesis to develop the theory of this stress distribution. And this shows the three stresses, the 1, 1, the 1, 2, and the 2, 2. And the gray lines are as a simpler theory, which is not, um, which is not quadratic. And the dots are the uh, simulations. And then the solid blue, black, and red lines are the fit with this theory. So we can see that we get an extremely good fit to understanding how the stress is distributed. And it's these small differences that give rise to all of the segregation. Now I'm going to uh, finish off with um, showing you another, a more natural granular flow rather than these idealized situations and how we can try to describe this with simple models. So this is a big avalanche from the test site in the west of Switzerland in Valley de la Sion. This is us walking up the debris. So what's nice about here is that we can blast these avalanches um, from a helicopter so we can control them. And what we did before this one is we went up there with a helicopter with a laser scanner and a good GPS. So we get a very detailed surface height measurement of the snow. We blast the avalanche and then we can rescan it afterwards and we can look at how has the surface height changed. So the blue regions here are regions where the net surface height has decreased so the snow has been eroded. The red and the yellow and the black regions, some of them more than 10 meters of snow, have been deposited. So can we try to explain this uh, type of behavior? This is my friend who was in the bunker under those 10 meters of snow at the bottom. We have a concrete bunker with some other instruments. <laughs> Had to dig him out from this one. But we can calculate. We know something about the snow properties. So because there's erosion and deposition happening at some places, it's a, you have to be a bit careful to actually calculate the deposit. But these are for two different avalanches where we did this. And we're looking at what the deposit depth. Well, that's actually. Let's go here. This is the deposit depth as a function of the slope angle. And what you'll see is that as the slope angle gets to about 35 degrees, there's no snow deposited because it's well above um, the angle of repose, even with cohesion. So here we have a frictional cohesion granular material. And once we get uh, below about 20 degrees, the material is below the angle of friction, so it won't flow. So it could be any depth. It can deposit deep. But in this intermediate regime, we have a, well, I won't have the equation here. We have a simple theory that matches up friction with cohesion, which gives these curves. So there is a tremendously complicated thing, you know, and we're still trying to develop a full model for this. We can actually, from the deposit, infer what the friction and the cohesion was and get good agreement. So what I hope I've shown is that direct simulation of granular systems is, is a really powerful tool, very really powerful tool. You have to be quite a patient and you have to have some friendly supercomputer owners who will let you do what you want to do. But the nice thing is you can really help yourself understand experiments much better. Because experiments, is dip often your measurements are going to be invasive. You have effects of sidewalls and vibrations and other things. And with the simulations, you can put these things in or take them out and really understand exactly what's going on. And these rather obtruse things, which you'd never be able to measure directly, such as you know individual components of the stress tensor, we can measure everything in a granular simulation and then compare our theoretical assumptions to develop models. And what I haven't talked about here is how the grains actually couple with the fluid. But this is sort of the new, uh, new frontier for these type of simulations that people are working on. And it's going to be very helpful for understanding these complete flows in the future. Thank you. coupling what what do you intend to explore there well actually it's people like Eckert who are mostly uh, developing that so if you just try to loosely couple the grains with the fluid and you don't take into account the volume of the grains you miss a lot of the physics it's okay for dilute systems but to really get a lot of the effects the pore pressure effects for example you have to include that so to be able to so there's all these models for debris flows for example 
and I you know, work a lot trying to develop models for debris flows, but it's extremely hard to get the pore pressure right. And that's because we don't quite, it's very hard to get good measurements. And one of the things I'm hoping is that with these type of direct simulations where we can figure out what's going on at the microscopic level, we can then develop better theories for debris flows in particular. So I missed the uh, answer about G, little g. It, sh it, has, it has no effect on friction. It, it, it's, it's impossible on dimensional grounds. If you change gravity in one of these experiments, it's exactly the same. In, in a drum experiment, it's the same as just changing the rotation rate. In a shoot experiment, it's the same as rescaling time. So a granular flow on Mars down a dune or something would look exactly the same as a granular flow on, um, on Earth if you change time by, you know, about 50% or something. If you played the movie back differently, you'd see no difference. Cheers. <laughs>